Hello, Crystal Palace. Welcome to the Up and Allwood Library Hub's Library Lunch. Um, this is a place to share positive and useful local information um, and keep us all connected during this time. So my guest today is Juno Sullivan, MBE, who is CEO of the London Early Years Foundation and a trustee of the Upper Norwood Library Hub. June, it's really lovely to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, um, pleasure. You, you've described yourself um, as a social entrepreneur and disruptor, and I'm really curious about what that means. I guess um, a social entrepreneur is somebody who runs a business uh, that makes a profit, but the business model is designed to address uh, some issue, community issue or, you know, economic issue. We call it a triple bottom line, you know, where we try and do business by um, A, by doing good, but that um, the way we build the business and the outcomes that we have from, from the business are going to deliver um, a, a social impact. So, for example, for us, I run nurseries, 39 nurseries across London. Um, and the business model is designed to ensure that children from poorer families access the nurseries easily. And we, so we basically we subsidize them through our fee structure. And then around that, we do other things like um, uh, apprentices, uh, additional training. Uh, sadly, at the moment, we have been doing lots of food banks and, and that kind of support. And so the idea, therefore, is that you can demonstrate to the world that you can run a very effective business and uh, support a large community of people in a in a marketplace, if you want to call it that, that could be that's also delivered by private sector that are tend to be um, funded through venture capital and shareholder funding, and that you can do it with a social kind of framework that delivers both the same level of service. In fact, in, in many cases, better. I mean, our uh, Ofsted outstandings are exceed the national. Um, the national average quite substantially and that's to prove that just because you're working in this notion of like with poverty doesn't mean you having to be the best in class mm -hmm. um and that you don't disrupt what is the accepted norm and so for me disrupting the accepted norm was very important in the nursery sector because it seemed absolutely wrong to me that children from poorer families tended to um be dependent on uh, insecure offers of nurseries and if they were often underfunded substantially and often therefore poorer quality. And that to me is like, how is that fair? How is that right? So you have to disrupt the market by showing them that you can be just as good as they are, deliver just as effectively as they are and, and better, but also, um, but do it with a social, social kind of remit, a social conscience. And so that's really what disruptive means. And if I had my way, the whole of Crystal Palace High Street, in fact, the whole triangle would be full of social enterprises delivering the best in class services, but with a social benefit. That is whether they were employing people who were disadvantaged. We had a big campaign for, say, apprentices from local areas. Um, the air, you know, we, we used very sustainable approaches to how we developed our business. So uh, where we sourced our food from or, you know, or anything, it can be as wide as or as narrow as you like. As I say, mm -hmm. in my case, it's really subsidizing children who would otherwise not be able to afford really high quality nurseries. And I think you've just answered my next question, which was going to be what led you to start the London Early Years Foundation? Yeah, I just so. think it's an overwhelming sense of fairness. I don't want to come across like, oh, you look at her, she's so saintly. It's none of that. It's just like I was a single parent years and years and years ago, and um, I needed to work nights. I was a psychiatric nurse, and I couldn't find a decent nursery for my son. And the nursery I did find said, um, I, I just went there after waiting in a queue for him, and I noticed that he was in the garden, and he was upset, and he was trying to get out. He was only two. And so I picked him up over the uh, fence. I was really upset. I was very young as well, and I wasn't knowledgeable. Um, and so I went back to, the, to the, the nursery leader at the time, and she shouted at me in front of all the parents saying, you know, I could have given this place to a, to a doctor, but I gave it to you, you know, you single parent, and you just, you know, what are you doing? And I was just so shocked at the idea that you could talk to someone like that, and that was acceptable, and that I had to leave my child in a place like that, that I didn't. So I took him away and um, and I don't know how I figured it out. Well, I do. I had a, a child mind from one of the nurses that I worked with whose mother was a retired person from Guyana and she used to come and sleep in the house while I went to work. Mm. And I just thought one day, one day, there'll come a ch I'll have a chance to do something differently and it'll come because things come serendipitously. They don't come in 
for me anyway they don't come in that kind of you know I've got a plan and then it's going to work in that kind of linear way I'm sure that does work for a lot of people but for me it's been a bit of disaster so my world has been very um serendipitous and led from a chat in a library to a somebody talking to you going down the hill <clears throat> to a cup of coffee uh you know to something else and and as a consequence when all the stars were aligned I was able to form the London Early Years Foundation which has now been running for over 10 years as a social business but before that it was a tiny little charity in Westminster which would be dead now if we hadn't changed it there's no mm -hmm. question it would it would be gone because it would have been dependent on local authority funding which is as you know you know exactly so random and um uh you know they they have it when they have it and they haven't it the rest of the time are it would be dependent on on grant and philanthropy and that's just no way to run a business and that's why we need to campaign for social businesses and crystal palace is such a good place to do that because we've got such an interesting community up here of you know thoughtful people who, and I know there are some people who work in social enterprises uh, live up here because I see them on the uh, train in the morning. And, um, you know, we're the place to show that you could create a whole economy up here. You know, we could have the Crystal Palace Pound if we wanted to. And, you know, we could develop a whole notion of how you can still do business and be effective and drive the best quality, mm -hmm. but you could do it with a social impact that actually would secure the community underneath and, and actually just engage people and you know bring create that kind of social network underneath that actually in the worlds like covid is what secures us yeah yeah absolutely um i'm just going to sideline quickly and say hello to some people who've joined us so thank you guys for watching and um, we've got letitia allison samantha emily linda justin and sarah so thank you guys all for watching. If you have any questions for June as we go along, please do drop them in the social media feed and we'll try and answer them as we go. So um, June, tell me a bit more about um, how London Early Years Foundation is uh, organised and run. So we're run like any business. Uh, I'm the CEO. I have a team around me and, um, and, and then we're pretty matrix after that. Uh, I've, I've not been... Really, not that keen on hierarchies in the sense that of course you need hierarchies to make decisions as you turn into a very big business because we are now kind of multi-million pound business but um uh you know the idea is that there are leads and champions and uh, people who are interested i love when people are interested in stuff i will make it happen for them you know so at the moment uh or just before covid we were really going down the sustainability and we had developed green leaf and um, my daughter is a, a gardener and a permaculturist and has been going on to me forever about how important this is and for children. So um, we developed a green leaf accreditation process. We were working with, uh, we were just starting to work with um, some big organizations to have it accredited. But while uh, we were in lockdown, well, I worked entirely in lockdown. I've never worked so hard in my life, actually. To be honest. <laughs> um, um, we have um, developed a level four qualification in developing sustainability in early year settings, written a book about it as well. And um, and uh, in fact, tonight we're doing a presentation on Zoom to uh, our staff. And then in that we'll have eco champions. And I've got so many staff of all different ages, you know, backgrounds, you know, color, class, creed, a whole lot who um, are interested in this whole green idea. Because often people think, you know, they kind of box people a bit as to who would be interested in it. It would only be certain people who'd be interested. That's not the truth at all. You know, um, so I have got some real green fingered people as well who are kind of leading the way on this. Um, because we can't have a world where a lar large number of our small children think that, you know, an apple comes wrapped in plastic mm. or a chicken comes already diced. You know, and so it's important for us that we uh, actually take them through that world. Plus, I mean, you know, gardening and being outside is so good for everyone's well-being. Um, so our children in the leaf nurseries are outside for a minimum of two hours wow. a day. And for me, there's no such business as being outside is, um, you know, scary. Being outside is good for you. And the only thing that makes a difference between being outside is having the right clothes. So uh, there's no barriers to being outside except a pair of welly boots and a, and a raincoat. And so they're out and they like being out and mm -hmm. the staff kind of have to um, be suitable for that. You know, and if we have staff who spend their entire time shivering and, you know, standing in the corner, then they're not really right for us. Mm -hmm. So the children are out over two hours a day as a minimum, as a minimum. 
and then they spend a lot of time gardening and digging for worms and um and you might say oh have you got big gardens no we haven't uh we're in we're in soho where we've got big gardens in say carlton hill and in east dulwich we have gardens that are so dark you can't really do much with them like at the uh like in pimlico we have no uh garden at the house of commons nursery we have a big wonderful garden at our nursery in um in teddington we have an underground garden at soho wow. so there's like this and uh, we have a roof garden at marshall street so there's like there's no perfect space like like up here in crystal palace one of the things about COVID that was very interesting for me was 20 minutes, half an hour walk we were allowed. Do you remember that? Mm. And some days I actually finished work on time to go and my son and I would go and investigate. And I had no idea just how many extra green spaces we have. I have, I figured out how to get to uh, the lakes through the back of that little park down Mowbray Road that I never would have known. Mm -hmm. uh, we walk regularly to, the, to uh, Beulah Heights. I never would have known about that and to South Norwood Hill. Um, the country park, which I've had on my list forever, I've now finally managed to do it. Uh, you know, it's incredible. So I think we are really lucky up here with our owls and our voles and our bats and uh, our woodpeckers. And, you know, and I just think, you know, somehow or other the bird song felt stronger. I don't know whether it was the lack of cars or, mm. you know, um, or the sort of sound was more amplified by the by the sense of no, just been quieter as yeah, well hasn't it recently people have been in so it was it's it suddenly realized just how powerful this is and how often we don't know our own neighborhoods so for mm. me this whole green leaf thing is really important for the children because we do walk them all mm. over london and uh they like a bus children i like a bus too if i went to mastermind my 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 subject would be the buses of london and so um <laughs> I know I was slightly obsessive, <laughs> but, but so that's been um, that's been really fascinating. So it's in all ways it's it's kind of confirmed the way we've been moving and 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 talking and thinking with the children. So it's made me even more determined mm. that we'll have sustainable nurseries and understand the kind of nine principles of permaculture and the SDGs. Even though at the moment we seem to have ramped up on plastic. Mm much plastic in my entire life mm -hmm. and there's like the whole ppe thing has um caused such a lo lot of confusion although all our nurseries have had their um their masks made with sunflower on them with using oh. sunflower fabric because we've got a sunflower campaign going at the moment because sunflowers are so wonderful aren't they and they follow the sun and they give you hope mm -hmm. and they smile up so all the children are um growing sunflowers um, wow. we have the sunflower masks made by a social enterprise run by my friend Jenny who is it's called Fashion Enter I like to procure from social enterprises when I can too mm -hmm. the Fashion Enter is based in Haringey she's not quite a Crystal Palace uh, resident she's just down the road in Hayes um, mm -hmm. but we can't you know you know, not everyone can have the luxury of living up here. Um, and so um, so there's her. And then the other social enterprise I work a lot with is Bike Works, which is based uh -huh. in East London. And they um, they make bikes um, as part of a um, kind of, you might call a leadership program. So uh, corporates and, and companies who want to do leadership uh, training and, you know, sort of team building. One of the things they do is they come to Bike Works, they make bikes. So bike works nice. have, uh, I know. So they've made 200 bikes for us across. Uh, <laughs> wow. I know. And then we've developed a, a bike loan scheme because lots of parents live in flats and they have no space for bikes. Mm -hmm. Bikes are expensive. Mm -hmm. And also many bikes that are, you know, purchased by families are not very good quality and they fall apart quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is loan those bikes to the families over the weekend so they can go to the local parks find their little, you know, Stanbourne Hill, you know, find all their little ways and then bring them back on a Monday. So they've used it over the weekend, built up that kind of confidence about going to the park and often just take them to ride home. Mm -hmm. So it's such a lovely idea that I can't understand how our prime minister doesn't want to support us to do this everywhere because that's really why we need to disrupt the notion of just accepting that mm -hmm. it's busy and the roads are, are, are scary. You know, mm -hmm. we need children to take over the roads in some ways um, yeah. <laughs> properly and sensibly and learn good manners I you know in, entirely but that you know it's 
it's such a big deal when you think about child obesity in London. Hmm. Such a problem. Such yeah. a problem. And it's only <laughs> going to get worse by COVID because you yeah. know, people will rely on the cheapest booze, which is full of sugar and um, fatty subs- substances. And we're all sitting at home. We're all sitting at home. A lot more as well. So, I think they yeah. say you could either become a, a chunk or a, a, was it? a chunk or a drunk. <laughs> Well, not both at once. I mean, I would have thought yeah, both I at once is definitely know, an the, option. The, the drunk might turn you into the chunk anyway, you yeah. know, when you have your <laughs> evening glass of wine on a regular basis just to punctuate the day. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so so as well as several hours outside and um, making sure they learn to ride bikes and things, tell us a bit about um, the rest of your teaching pedagogy. Oh, our ped- pedagogy is called uh, the LEAF Pedagogy, and um, we now have a degree in the LEAF mm. Pedagogy, which we've done with Wolverhampton University. Um, and we've used Wolverhampton because they were innovative, they were quick thinking, and they were interested. Um, and so staff that come to me as apprentices, and I have a lot of apprentices, can go all the way through now to end up being graduate. Um, so I'm, very, I'm always very proud of that. Um, and so there are seven strands of the pedagogy because the pedagogy is how we lead children to learn. That all is what it means. It's how do we lead them to learn? And it's not just about the curriculum. Our first element, of course, is the curriculum, the spiral curriculum, which is how do you uh, teach and what do you teach them? Um, and as you probably hear from me, it's all about creativity and language and mm-hmm. singing and drama and outside and playing and just wallowing in play. I really like children. I really like small children. They are really interesting characters, but they are plagued by a society that doesn't get them quite often Mm -hmm. and puts them in places that they shouldn't be and actually squashes them. Whereas actually, if you expand, you you know, and I'm not saying I'm one of those that let them run free. I am not. They all have manners. They all learn how to behave. And they all, people comment all the time about how well behaved the children are when they're out and how courteous they are and how, um, you know, careful they are about where they are and how they behave. Mm-hmm. It's not that, but actually children really need to play. It's really powerful for them. It's really, it, it's so instinctive and so um, necessary. And yet we squash it out of them with um, the way we behave nowadays, putting them into schools too early, um, you know, making them kind of learn things, sending them on these clubs all the time. When actually quite often what they just want is time. And that's been very noticeable with COVID for our children because we were open the whole time because we have a lot of uh, NHS parents and the likes. Right. The children loved the time to just absorb what was going on around them at, at a pace that was their pace. Mm-hmm. And the conversations they had with the staff, we have sofas in all our nurseries as part of our pedagogy, and the snuggling up conversations they had all about stories and telling and tell me a story with your mouth and book, you can now see why I'm part of the library, because these really matter to me, you know, books, stories, and talking, and extending vocabulary in a most natural way. So that's our spiral curriculum, it's about how we teach and how we extend. Obviously, you can't do anything without the right environment, because that's like the third teacher. And then from that, you have to have harmonious relationships, and that has to be at every level, all the way through to the community. And then find the next element of it is safe, fit and healthy. So, you know, safe fit and healthy for us is the green leaf thing. You know, it's the yoga we've been doing with the children for a long time. Oh. Really teach them to stretch and, you know, just engage and be calm and, and sort of quiet down and just feel they like to talk about their how they feel their, you know, their breathing is going on and they put their hands on their heart and calm down. Um, and uh, and also the, all the child obesity stuff, the bicycles I just talked about, the parks being outside. Then we have obviously home learning, and we've done a humongous amount of this during lockdown because we have uh, four and a half thousand children, so that's a lot of families. Wow! Um, and so many families are working; it's really hard for them actually. And while we opened fifteen nurseries, we didn't, you know, the the law said. You know the rules were they could only be essential workers our vulnerable children so obviously that's what we took so two weeks ago we opened much wider and now we have nearly 800 children in with us and so many parents were so very keen to come back and then we hope to gradually you know extend the numbers and and support them so the home learning will continue you know we've done videos on what to do 10 things to do with the newspaper uh how to how to make this out of lids what book we've done the reader raising readers is our book club 
And so this week it's uh, Giraffes Can't Dance, you know, by uh, Giles Andre. Um, and so um, we're doing lots and lots of stuff like that. But it was all based on um, what would you have in your house? There was no need to go on Amazon to buy anything. It's like, what can you find in your house? And that we would, we used all of those. And I think people liked that because it was mm -hmm. more possible. And that included obviously baking, cooking and all that stuff if you had time as well. That's a lovely mix of being creative and not, and keeping the sustainable exactly. element as well, isn't it? And then the final element of our seven strands is of course, community. You have to understand where a child comes from in their community. You have to understand your community. You can't build inclusive, connected relationships with people if you don't walk the streets if you don't know where people live if you don't know that old mrs you know you know shaw lived there for the last hundred years and now you've moved into her block you know if you don't understand the history and again the library is a perfect example of that what a wonderful history the library has so we have to fight to keep it because once that's gone that's really part of a very interesting heritage that crystal palace has uh, you know, very interesting stories we have. And I think in the library, we get a lot of that because people come in and talk about it and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that for us is powerful. And we do loads of work with older people, but also with teens and toddlers. That's young people who are more likely to maybe go off the rails. You bring them into the nursery for six weeks, you work with them in their schools, mm -hmm. and they often become our apprentices because wow. maybe school isn't a great place for them, but in a workplace mm -hmm. and where they feel valued because the children are like, oh it's a big boy Ooh. you know and, <laughs> and we do and lots of work on men in childcare anyway because we think that's very important and it's part of our inclusive kind of approach and it's like oh you know it's a big boy in my nursery <laughs> does does the element of um them them then feeling a, a sort of a duty of care to the little kids do, does that make a difference Precisely. and it builds their own confidence because suddenly they feel valued because someone's looking up to them mm and making them responsible and they take it terribly seriously i mean terribly seriously oh. so you know people that would sort of look across the road over some of these you know young people in a group you know that you might cross the road and go oh, gosh i'm not sure about them you put them in a nursery they're no more than the four-year-olds themselves really <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and it works really well i mean i i really like it it's a really good charity teens teens and toddlers yeah Oh, it sounds like you've got an amazing, uh, an amazing thing that you've built and an amazing um, set of links with other social enterprises and things. It's fantastic. The way um, to go, social enterprises. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, what, what, what plans for the future do you have, uh, assuming that, that uh, things aren't disrupted too much? Disrupted maybe is the wrong word to use. I think that's in my head because you've been talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the plan is to disrupt the model and maybe we use COVID as an example to show that actually you can do things. So I have to survive. We have to survive. All my team and I, we have to survive because we have to prove that even in the worst pandemic nightmare, the social enterprise business model is, can, can survive. Mm -hmm. I think um, we can't continue the way we are. This is crazy, the world mm -hmm. we live in. Um, if I was mayor for the day, of course, I would be ferocious on litter. I can't bear it. I can't stand it. I'm always on supporting on Twitter. I'm always supporting Clean Up Britain. Um, you wouldn't see a drop of litter in any of our nurseries. Oh my gosh, you'd have the really razor sharp edge of my tongue if you found anyone dropping on <laughs> I just don't understand that kind of lack of civic duty and that that you know failure to recognize your contribution to, to the community. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go and people just stand there and just drop it next to you, you just think, mm -hmm. how can you even do you not feel even shame here? Mm. So I think that's what we seriously need to do is to see how we can create a world for our children that's clean and respectful. Um, and therefore they're taught also to be respectful of their environment. Um, I want to take more apprentices. So anyone living in Crystal Palace who's interested in working with, with us, we're very interested in, and you could come to us at level one and we'll take you right to the degree, in fact, I've just appointed one of my ex uh, apprentices who started with me 16 years ago as wow. a um, as a young apprentice. Cried all the way through the interview, but I knew she had potential, <laughs> and she's now just become our first apprentice manager. Oh, and that is the best. Um, and some of my apprentices are managers now, and they've gone through the ranks. And some of them are teachers. Everyone in Leaf is called a teacher um, because I expect them to teach. 
Um, and so we're always looking for apprentices. So anyone up here, um, please, please, please. Are there any, any particular fields for apprenticeships? Well, I'm, obviously early years is our big one. So becoming an early years teacher is the majority, but we do have a apprentices in IT, in uh, HR, um, in uh, marketing, um, and, um, and then we have our Chef Academy. I forgot about our Chef Academy. Amazing. So yeah, so we opened the first early year Chef Academy last year in Brixton, um, in one of our nurseries there. Actually, it's not, it's really between Brixton and Stockwell. But anyway, it's at the, at the nursery called Stockwell Gardens. And we have uh, six uh, units and um, so we're and a proper qualification, the first ever written for any chefs working with children under eight, because it's a special skill. Um, and so we're keen to develop apprentices, uh, chef apprentices, young people who are interested in becoming chefs, who want to work in schools and, you know, in nurseries. And I think probably quite transferable in care sector as well, because of the way we uh, are interested in food. So we've got that in uh, in Stockwell and we have really interested in apprentices in that world as well. And then if someone comes to me and they show interest and enthusiasm and I find I often find just something for them. Okay. Because, you know, what you want is a team of loyal, committed, enthusiastic, energetic staff who stay with you a long time and bring real added value because they bring their delight and their joy to work with them. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we'll spread the word. As oh, best thank we you. Can. Sure. Yeah. Tweet <laughs> out. Yeah. <laughs> so we're pretty much out of time, I'm afraid, but I'm going to leave you with one one more question, which is what um, what piece of advice would you give to somebody else wanting to start a social enterprise? OK, um, a social enterprise is a business. So get your business plan sorted. Don't think anyone will feel sorry for you because you put the word social before your business plan. They won't. The banks don't care. You know, when you're going for money, they want to know your business is, sol is, is solid and that you want to be best in class. Mm -hmm. um, connect with um, Social Enterprise UK. That's the membership organization for, that, for, for social enterprises, of which I do sit on the board. So I have a vested interest in that. <laughs> Go and visit a couple of social enterprises. We're generally quite, you know, we're generally quite generous with our time. Or follow, you know, us on Twitter or whatever, and then ask questions. Don't, you know, we've all made hundreds of mistakes. So if you can avoid it, then learn from us. But be brave. Step out there. We need more social entrepreneurs. So go out there, disrupt the sector. And while you're at it, join the Upper Norwood Li Library Hub and come in there and increase our footfall and make sure that we're there 100 years, you know, in the future. Brilliant, thank you very much. I think I might ask you to come back and chat to us again about the Upper Norwood Library Hub and your role as trustee, because I just haven't had time to cover that today. So please come back and chat to us again. Okay. <laughs> All right then. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so just before we finish, everybody, um, as you know, we've got a great big live streaming program um, through the Upper Norwood Library Hub. If you haven't checked it out already, please do. There's some very exciting projects happening at the moment. We have All Alone Together, which has been funded by the Arts Council. We're really looking for people to get involved. Um, the uh, commitment to this can be absolutely minimal. We have a very short survey that will take you less than 10 minutes. Um, we'd be so grateful uh, for anybody who would fill that in. Um, if you're up for spending a little bit longer, then there's an option there to be interviewed. Um, please tick that. I'd love to have a chat with you. That will take about an hour um, and it will just be a really friendly chat. That's it. Um, there's a few more strands of that um, project as well, which I'm going to tell you more about as we go through this week. So tune in to hear about that. Um, tonight, seven o'clock, um, through the Upper Norwood Library Hub Facebook page, um, we have the South East Salon, um, which tonight is um, focusing on race and social justice. Um, so do tune in and have a listen to that. Um, that's it for me for today. Um, so hopefully see you tomorrow. We have Crystal Palace Community Trust talking to us tomorrow. Um, so tune in to hear from them. Thanks very much, June. It's great to chat to you. Um, stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye bye, Eleanor. Thank you.